not have that figured out. Okay, there we go. That seems a touch too loud. What do you guys think? Welcome, everyone. I'm going to minimize that so I don't see my own face strictly more than necessary for this experience. Welcome to the live stream. We are, it says, okay, it says we're live. Cool, okay. Good evening to you as well. So I promised everyone that I would be bringing this back because it's been a while. Um, so we're referencing that, I guess, is <laughs> the theme of this live stream is a uh, little Ouija and, and Fiji. I got this at Buffalo Exchange when I was still in university. So, oh, probably six years ago at this point. Don't know why that sounded Canadian, but it did. So, Ouija and Fiji. Because some people that still watch me were around when I referenced that like a year ago. <laughs> However long that was. Um, hi, Evie. I hope you're having a good day. I am having a great day today. I got so much stuff done. I recycled stuff. I cleaned the house. I did laundry. Candle covers are... An interesting thing. So, if people don't know about how Kindles work, maybe premium Kindles are different, but they always show like a random advertisement and they're almost always like the worst romance novel. I mean, this one has 233 five star reviews apparently. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> but I thought I'm on a new book. And I thought because it was so fun last time, maybe we would read some more um, of a different, same author, different book. And uh, I'm already noticing a lot of similarities. I'm like 20% of the way in this one. It's like four times as long as the previous book, which I did not realize when I purchased it. It was free on Kindle Unlimited. So uh, not really wasting any money in particular that I wouldn't have because Kindle Unlimited. But welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, EV. Not to be accused of me, EV, but E and V is in the letters. Um, hey, girl, are you lost? Uh, I'm not lost. I am doing just fine, uh, Eric. Hello, Valerie. Hello, Damien. Hello, Christopher Graves. Hello, Emma. Hello, My Chemical Romance. Hello, Yvonne. Hello, Maya. Hello, Kelsey. Hello, Cynthia. Hello, Sean. Hello, Crafty Elf Girl. Hello, Violet Viewer and Bound Mouse and Blueberg. Hello, everyone. Hopefully you are having, I don't know, hopefully, yes. Hopefully you are having a great end to your week, a good Friday, hanging out with me in my blender bottle full of water. Because hydration is important. Welcome, Theser. Welcome, Jared. So I know the last couple times we've had like a theme to the live streams. So I thought this time, instead of having like, I mean, other than the Wee Teen Fiji thing, which like five people are going to understand, um, <laughs> we would do like just a good old fashioned Q&A. Maybe I should change the title so it says that. Good old fashioned Q and A. So, oh, I ran out of room in the title. We're gonna have to get rid of some emojis, unfortunately. Sorry. Slash Ouija and Fiji slash erotica question mark. Yeah, that sounds like a good summary of my average live stream. That sounds about right. The ears have returned. Oh yeah, I should mention I am um, wearing ears currently. I've been I've been wearing them a little bit more recently, like the last couple of days specifically. I've been wearing them more because um, my hair has it's mostly for practical reasons. My hair has grown out, and obviously I haven't been to the hairdressers because COVID. I went like two months ago to get a bang trim, and then after that I have I'm just trying to limit how often I go to places. So I haven't been back again, and so my bangs are like full on. 
um, like Sephiroth level of like they're down to like here ish. And so I'm like, oh, we need to tame these a little bit. So, uh, headband. Oh, what was that? My phone is like exploding. Oh, somebody's texting me. If you're on the stream right now, you're interrupting my stream. The, per the person who's texting me usually watches. So we have the ears back. They're pulling my hair back. They're beautiful. If people want to know for where they're from. I've had these for years. They're from Atelier Creatura, a name that I will always mispronounce for forever. And I don't... I think they still make ears. I really don't keep up to date with like who makes ears. Like occasionally I'll find a place I like and I'll save them in case one of the pairs that I really like gets damaged or something and I want a replacement. So I have a couple of places I still follow on Instagram, but I really don't keep up with like pet place specific gear at this point. So they may still make stuff. I think they mostly do auctions, but really great stuff. Like the shape, the size is just like, I think we can agree perfect for me if it's my vibe. So there you go. There you go. I also, I don't know if anybody can see, like my little glisten. I got some new makeup products I've been playing with, which are exciting. I got the Cover FX like custom cover drops and I did kind of like underneath my foundation, which I haven't tried before. And I think we like it. I think we like this look. <laughs> yes, where did you get your ears? Um, yes, I already answered. They're really hard to get ear, ears from though. So um, I would not get your hopes up for them if you wanted to get a specific replacement. There's so, my understanding anyways, because again, I don't really keep up with this stuff. Is there a lot of people who make ears on Instagram, on Etsy? I'm sure you can find a very lovely replacement. Um, I'd always wanted to get ears from the kitten collection because I always, I loved their collars back when I used to wear ones that weren't just this one. Um, and I have always wanted to get one from them and I never have. So maybe one day we will have another gear slash ear review, but not today, not today. Okay. So We've given everybody a couple minutes to get into the stream, which means now I have to ruin the flow of everything with <laughs> telling people what the rules are. And just so we know, again, oh my God, I have once again failed to finish making the stream graphics I intended to make this week. So here are the rules for the live stream, everyone. Are you listening? These are very important. So number one, 18 plus only. If you're a minor, please don't be here. Um, please don't talk to other people in the chat. Please don't ask me questions. If you are younger than 18 and you're like, I know BDSM is for me and this is what I want to do when I'm an adult. Totally understand that. I'm not trying to tell young people that they don't know their bodies or their desires or that they're incapable of learning about this, but um, it's for your safety, my safety, everyone's safety to not have minors and adults interact while talking about BDSM. So if you could just refrain being here if you're not 18 yet uh that is the law where i live and so because this is my stream we have to abide by the laws of the location where i am at and not what the laws of denmark are for example so just keep that in mind please um there are other places you can go to such as for example scarletine which is a good platform for teenagers to get help and advice from either like professional adults that are like certified to talk about these sorts of things with children and other children. So just keep that in mind. Thank you so much. All right. There are also rules and FAQ down below in the description box if you want to check that out because I have been doing this for a long time. I do a lot of Q and A's. And so just over time, we kind of collect some commonly asked questions. And so if you have something you want to ask along the lines of where did you get your collar from? how can I tell my boyfriend I'm into BDSM? Help, I want to open my relationship, like that kind of stuff. I am totally open at answering specific questions, but those sort of general kind of um, general simple questions, FAQ down below. Because uh, again, I've been doing this for a while. And then just some general guidelines for things that I don't typically discuss I would really really love it if we could refrain from giving mental health advice physical health advice you know I'm not a doctor I'm not a lawyer I'm not a therapist 
if you want to ask me help evie i have depression and i want to do bdsm what should i do i don't know i uh, i don't know your individual situation i don't know your treatment protocol Ugh. i would love to help but i just don't feel like i have the knowledge to be able to do that so yeah those are really just the guidelines for this live stream and we'll go with that so there you go i have like this knot in my hair that's like the one thing about long hair having long hair now that i really don't enjoy is getting like knots in my hair occasionally for no reason uh, i hate it all right so those are the rules if anybody has any questions let me know if anybody needs clarification on anything let me know and uh again i'm happy to answer specific questions if you have like a specific situation where you can give me like information backstory you know help me with this specific thing totally happy to assist in that area also i'd love to know because i always love to ask is it anybody's first live stream uh because you know I like to get that information. Every once in a while, we get a live stream, but there's like a bunch of new people. And I try to, like, if it's mostly people that have been here before versus mostly people that are new, uh, that also, I, I don't want to talk down to people who already kind of know some stuff. But if a lot of people here are like, I don't know anything about BDSM, this is my first live stream, I want to make sure I explain enough things in my answers to not make anybody feel dumb. All right. Aw, just about to cook my sir breakfast. New Zealand just down the lockdown rules. We haven't seen each other in a month. I'm so happy. Oh, that's so great. I'm glad you could see your sir again. That is amazing. <laughs> Have you seen Mr. Jackson YouTube tutorials on cutting bangs? Um, I have not. I'm sure if I did, he would be down for that. But... We don't really have any scissors to cut hair with. Uh, I would be suspicious. I would be like, what are we gonna do, kitchen scissors? Uh, yeah, I guess with craft scissors? None of those seem like good options for hair cutting. And I usually, I get my bangs kind of like choppy. I've done them a couple different ways. I've, I've done the really blunt bangs, but those are so annoying to keep straight. And especially if you're filming your own face a bunch, you just, you notice constantly when things are off so i've done them like kind of choppy before as well which i think i like i've done them kind of like rounded so they're kind of like longer and tapered on the side which i think is my favorite way to get it done but uh he has not cut my bangs before <laughs> uh did they do mouse ears do any of the shops you fall on insta do mouse ears um so again i really do not keep up with places and who makes what like i again like i said i have a couple of shops that i follow but like i'm looking at like puppy stuff so like if they've got puppy wolf canine style ears that's really what i'm looking at and i don't really pay attention to anything else but if anybody knows the name of a shop that does do mouse ears if you would if you want to share that feel free just um, don't put a link in because if you're not a moderator, YouTube just automatically flags all uh, links and chats as spam. So if you put the name of the shop, that would be sufficient. But uh, unfortunately, I do not know anywhere that makes mouse ears in particular. But I, I think I've seen them before. I just can't think of a shop in particular. Uh, sir dyed my hair purple two weeks ago. Did not know it would make my hair so dry. Any suggestions? um i mean definitely like dyeing hair can be complicated i guess is it dry in the sense like is it like straw like like a i'm not a cosmetologist so everything here with a grain of salt like is it dry like straw like like does it stay wet for a really really long amount of time like it's super damaged or is it just like a little bit drier than it normally would oloplex is great if you feel like it's just like really really damaged you can even get it from alta uh now as well which is fantastic um if it's just like regular dry leave-in conditioner is fantastic do recommend i have 
an entirely too expensive leave-in conditioner that I try, which is, it's like Davines, D D A V I N E S, Davines. Um, Davins? I may actually be mispronouncing that. I'm not confident how you pronounce the, the name of the brand, but I have a, like a, like, um, styling like a leave-in conditioner spray that I use that I really really enjoy um I also really liked like L'Oreal used to make like it was like L'Oreal and it was in like black packaging which I realize is like half of the hair care section um it was like a naturals like kind of eco-friendly sort of uh hair conditioner thing when my hair was drier than it is currently and I really enjoyed that but if it's like really bad the best thing you can do is see a professional hairstylist or probably go on the parts of YouTube where YouTubers who are professional hairstylists give hair advice Uh, I've just been dyeing my hair black for like seven years um, basically, I, since I was a freshman in college, I started dyeing my hair black. And uh, I've never really had issues with it being super dry or being really damaged because I always use like a demi-permanent uh, uh, or I use like 10 volume for the developer. So I have not tried to like bleach my hair or lift color out of it or do any of the things that would make it even more dry than it already is just adding dye to it. But um, I wish you luck. I wish you luck. <laughs> Kids go away is the gist. Yes, exactly. Ever do a topic on bare ass spanking? I mean, have I not made a video about spanking yet? It's probably, if I haven't already, it's on the list for sure. For sure. Um, but spanking, bear, uh, bear ass spanking, I have not done a video on, I probably do a video on just, like, general spanking at some point, but it's also very interesting, so part of the reason why I haven't made a video about it yet is when you get into spanking, like, as a concept and you're researching it, um, it, how do I, like, it ends up going into the weeds in a bunch of really unexpected directions, because spanking, some people mean just like literally like with a bare hand and that's it that's the only implement like that's how i think of spanking is with your own hands on somebody's butt it could be over clothing it could be without clothing it could be over underwear something like that and that's what i think of with spanking some people also use spanking to mean impact play in general on the butt that could include things like paddles hairbrushes canes although which things count as spanking and which things then count as their own thing also gets kind of muddy like some people would be like oh but paddles are paddling but some people would count paddles in spanking and some people it just and then you get into spanko culture which is for people who it, there's like a venn diagram of people who are are spankos that are into the bdsm community and I would consider, like, Spanko to be, like, a subculture within BDSM, but not everybody who's a Spanko considers themselves to be part of the BDSM community, and they have their own parties and cult- cultural norms, and, like, it is, like, the co- topic with Spanking ends up getting way more complicated than you think it would be, but, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a good one, you know, it's classic, for sure, it's classic for sure, but, that's one of the fun things about doing 101 videos is it's very rarely well sometimes it is very like simple and definitional and that's kind of the point of it but it oftentimes goes in these very interesting directions where it's like oh I thought I was gonna make one video about this but actually in order to fully explain this I have to make like two or three or this is gonna be 45 minutes long which uh is honestly one of my favorite parts of making videos Mm, question oh and thank you for putting that in like all caps so I could clearly see it was a question I love that you don't need to do that but it does help me make sure that I notice it's a question especially if you're not somebody who always remembers to put in question marks um 
what is a virtual event or class you were looking forward to or one you enjoyed recently? I saw a pet play event called The Chase is doing a virtual version this year and I'm so excited about it. I have not heard of The Chase before. I am really interested to see what it is. I'll probably Google it after this live stream is done. Um, I... Uh, my favorite educator like the person I will always like 100% recommend to anyone if you see one of his classes or one of his books and you're thinking oh maybe I could go to that go to it because it will always be a really rewarding experience is Lee Harrington and I actually subscribed to his newsletter and I just got one earlier today let me see if I can pull it up because I am all for advertising for uh for uh, Lee Harrington. Not that he needs me to advertise for him, but um, they have they have a class about switching coming up, which I'm curious about taking because I always, like I get so many questions about switches that I can't answer because I don't really have experience there. And I definitely know people that are switches, but everyone I know that's a switch does it in this very specific way where they switch and that they have a partner that is their dominant and then they have people that they talk to or people that they bottom to and so I don't know anybody like really well that switches with their same partner so I'm always looking for more information so I can make better videos catered to the needs of switches in my audience so I'm looking forward to that one and then there's one that I missed that I wanted to go to a couple weeks ago that Lee Harrington also did which was about it's like personality types in BDSM, which I am like, I don't know if anybody knows this about me. I love psychology. I love analyzing things. Like I've always found like a studying psychology with the exception of cognition. I, if, it, if it's about perception and like mostly perception, actually perception, if I'm reading about like the psychology of perception, that shit messes with my brain hardcore I cannot that just messes with me but other realms of psychology I really enjoy reading about and so learning about like personality types and how that interacts with BDSM I think is really interesting because I think it's a factor that can play into or at least I imagine it would be a factor that plays into how we approach negotiations who we want to play with the types of scenes we want to have what we need for aftercare not to say that I should be really careful about this this is not saying that personality types predetermined like it's not like you get a like a oh you're um the lion zodiac so that means like it's not that let that way it's more meant as like a general tendency of if these sorts of features describe your personality or describe your partner's personality here are some ways to think about like their love languages for example because it's it was a conversation if i remember correctly it may have actually been two different classes I'm thinking of now that I'm thinking about it more. There was one that was talking about love languages and one that was talking about um, personality in BDSM, like personality types. And I think both of those things can make such a big difference in having better scenes and especially having better BDSM relationships because, I mean, most of us understand ourselves like fairly well. But understanding our partners, especially if our needs are really different or our personality types are very different, I think can be a big bridge to overcome to having a better relationship. And so I love getting to have those conversations because especially with the way that Lee Harrington does his classes, they are always so personalized to the people in that room having that conversation in that moment so even if he's teaching the same class that i've taken before if i'm not doing anything and it's free i'll pop lee harrington 10 bucks and i'll hang out in the chat and be like oh this is a different conversation than the thing we did last time because it's it's so much based around what the individual people in that room at that time are looking for and i really really enjoy that because obviously like even these live streams right like different people come in with different questions sometimes we have a ton of new people sometimes it's mostly people that have been here before and off of that I try to kind of customize the experience shall we say so that is my very long answer to what is a virtual event that you're looking forward to uh anything by Lee Harrington um I would love it if my local community would like get their collective crap together and start doing events but so far I only know of one munch that is ran by a friend that is at the same time as my live streams and so I have not been able to go to those but my local dungeon is really just super 
dropped the ball on virtual events um there's like a members only slash volunteers munch that happens that's online but like guys if i'm being totally honest like my job's on the internet like i'm on camera all the time i'm doing video calls with people i'm live streaming i'm filming like for me it's not really recharging to have sort of an informal like vaguely guided discussion is like a form of socialization because I get that through my job so I like having classes I like having sort of structured learning events but having like play parties online or having kind of casual munches is not really something that I find feeds me at least right now I mean if quarantine goes on for another like six months a year whatever like I will probably eat my words and have different opinions but currently that's um I'm not really looking at those sorts of things from my online kink experience important note now that i've said a bunch of things about being online and doing bdsm um i generally do not give advice on long distance bdsm relationships that primarily or originally started online uh, because that is outside of my experience um so just just everybody everybody's paid attention to that I hope because it's like the number one question I still get is like advice for long distance relationships and I've tried to cover that in other videos um like where I've talked about dealing with COVID dealing with quarantine just to kind of get my advice that I have out there but I don't have personal experience knowing how those things actually happen in real life so I don't I, I feel like the best videos that I make the best advice I can give is when they are based on something that I not only know about but also something that I have personal experience with to sort of be like and here's when things went wrong for me and here's what I learned to make this thing better and here's my sort of own personal tips that I found work for me um And those are also the ones that I just feel like more confident making because um, if you don't have personal experience doing it, it's really hard to be authoritative about it. But yeah, that's um, that's my hot tea. (laughs) Those ears are so cute, what the fuck? (laughs) Aww, you're so welcome. I love them so much. They are very great. I have these ones that are black and gray and I have ones that are solid black and they're... I don't really need anything else. I kind of wanted... I have a pair of like floppy puppy ears that kind of fold over in the front. And I like those all right, but I find that they slide a lot. So I've kind of, maybe at some point in time, I could get another pair of like floppy puppy ears. Cause when I got those, that was like four years ago, like nobody was making puppy stuff. Like it was all kittens, 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 and sometimes wolves and sometimes foxes. There is no puppy stuff, especially not floppy puppy ears. And I got a pair and I liked them. They were pretty good, but they're just, they move too much. I feel like they were a little bit out of portion for my head kind of um because I do not have particularly voluminous hair as you can tell um I come from a long line of people with very thin hair it is um a sad genetic fact of being an Eevee but um anyways ears everybody loves talking about them we all we love talking about the ears what can we say you know people love it I love it (laughs) I remember back in the day ah could reminisce about the old Instagram days when that was like the primary way I consumed BDSM related content. Times have changed, have they not? Ooh, interesting question from Pete. Looking at choosing a collar to officially collar my submissive, moving from consideration to collared, but can't choose an exact style design, etc. Um, I totally get that. It is very difficult to like I think for me what I always have to think about with those types of decisions is it's about making a decision not making the perfect decision and it's really easy to be like I need to pick the best thing humanly possible that's going to eternally symbolize our love for each other and the devotion in our relationship and if I don't pick the right thing then it's going to destroy everything it's not it's at the end of the day it's a symbolic piece of jewelry right if it's a little bit too long or too short or the wrong type of metal like as long as you're not allergic to it like it'll probably be okay 
And it's always something that if you find like later on that it doesn't work out for practical reasons or they don't love it as much, like you can always like, you know, people get engagement rings, they get married when they're 18 and they have $2 and they get something from like, um, what are those called? You know, those little like, um, you put like a quarter in and then it gives you like a little plastic toy or something out. Like they get one of those, right? Cause they got $2. And they get married with that, and it's about sort of the love and the devotion in the relationship. And then later on, when they have more money, when they know each other better, when they can afford it, then they get a better ring or they get a different ring, right? You know? And so I think if you're moving from consideration to collard, don't think about it as you're making an eternally permanent life decision. Like, you're not literally welding it on their body, I would assume. So you have opportunities in the future to change it. Maybe when you have, like, a one-year contract update or when you've been together for two years or five years. Like, you can always change it later. You're not making a permanent choice here. And honestly, like, do you want this to be a secret for your submissive? Because I think that's also an important factor here. Some people, uh, I know people that have gone both ways with it, where people kind of treat going from the stage of consideration to being collared as being like a really intense like ongoing conversation about like where the relationship is headed the goals you want to have set and so being formally collared is not a surprise to them not not a surprise to the submissive especially they they know that they've been on this path and so there's lots of opportunities in that framework to have conversations about like what kind of collar would you like what kind of you know figuring out those details together to find something that you both enjoy to make sure the kind of remove the anxiety for you of making the correct decision about is this the right collar um versus like trying to keep it more as a surprise or private um and so you can't have those conversations where you're super specific about like um, what do you like or what would you want from a color? I mean, I still think you can kind of ask those things in a covert way if you're okay with giving them hints that it might be coming, you know? I'm not sure how people who get engaged do this, um, like in terms of their partner picking out the engagement ring. It must be very stressful because they're quite expensive. But like, I feel like if you could tell them like maybe like make a Pinterest board, like you can make it a task, right? Like make it, ooh, this is what you do. You hack, you hack their sub brain <laughs> and you make it a task for them to make a Pinterest board or a folder or email you something that like is like, these are like, show me like pictures of colored submissives that you find attractive or that you would want to aspire to be like, or that you enjoy the look of, like find some way to get them to, contribute ideas to help you make the right choice without necessarily giving everything away but I totally get the stress about it I guess don't worry too much about it because it's about the move you're making in the relationship not the object that symbolizes it as much and I can say that because I have this so I mean um I guess I don't have to I I, I, I am past the stage where I have to worry so extensively about such choices but I I understand the anxiety my hair tangles so easily. I think I want to braid it or something just for convenience. Honestly, honestly, uh, honestly, and that's going to be a new word, honestly. We're making that happen. Um, <laughs> braiding is the best. I very recently figured out how to do it. I'm not very good at it. I never braided my hair when I was younger. Um, I just wore it long. I had really long hair when I was younger, like from childhood until middle school I had very long hair like almost probably I think it was a little bit longer than what I have now um oh my gosh thank you so much smart life for twenty dollars bless smart life if you have a question besides thank you I'm I'm happy to answer um <laughs> I feel like I should do more for twenty dollars but um uh, thank you very much um I'll just I'll just leave it at that um anyways what were I talking about oh Hair tangling, braids. Um, yeah, I never learned how to braid my hair. My mom used to do very funky hairstyles with my long hair, um, but I never learned how to braid it. I did learn how to put it in a ponytail. That was about it. So I recently figured out how to braid it behind. I can do like a side braid, um, which is convenient for working out, braiding hair. Love it for that. Um, but I've also done it like when I was in Belize. Oh, remember we used to be able to travel? That was a time, right? I went to Belize last May. God, and I was like planning. I was like so excited to go again the next year and be like, we're going to go on another vacation. And then obviously that didn't happen. 
but I got my hair braided when I was there and I just wore my hair in braids for like three or four days in a row and then um, it just made it so much easier because it was so windy that like if I didn't have my hair braided it was just it was a time it was an experience especially so I guess what I'm saying is if you're going to be in the water a lot and on vacation eventually in the next two years uh, braid your hair <laughs> that's what I have to say about that Oh my gosh, so many new people. Welcome, Cynthia and Jared and Rain and Candace and Harper and Megan and Amber and Elise and Rain and Brittany and Moon and Valerie, who's her second stream, actually. I don't know what your pronouns are. Sorry if I got that wrong. Uh, and Evie and Stonks and Sassy Sue. Welcome all to your first live stream. I hope this is an informative and engaging experience. <laughs> that is what we aim for. Ah, explain collar briefly. Um, a collar is a thing that you wear in some BDSM relationships to symbolize the devotion and power exchange of that relationship. If you have further questions beyond that, I would highly recommend checking out my BDSM 101 playlist, which uh, conveniently explores such topics in great detail. Oh my gosh. Hello, David. Hello, Chantel. Chan Chan Chantel? Yes, maybe. Uh, welcome, welcome. Um, oh, and Kat. First time also being on a live stream. Whoa! Oh my, <laughs> thank you guys so much. Hi, Jared. Uh, nice to meet you. Take my money. Uh, nice to meet you too. Thanks for being here. I should have rewards for people that donate stuff but um, I'll just say thank you um thank you for your answer um bringing up bringing up the UK Rep maybe is that like representing the UK I love the UK I was in um two summers ago I was in London and Scotland and we traveled around and it was a fun time and I frequently think about going back because it was such an amazing time it was like the middle of summer like July and it was like got to like 40 celsius I think which is um my ideal temperature range <laughs> that tells you guys anything about me uh and you know I go back not necessarily a fan of the kink clubs that I went to whilst we were there but I did get to rent a really cool private dungeon in London which was like in somebody's flat like at the it was so weird it was in a council house I think at like the top floor of a council house and then like it was like four rooms that were all really tiny like postage stamp size but it was like a horror's bdsm paradise there was a vacuum bed there were like just dozens of shoes and canes and paddles and whips and just things i never like the man has been collecting the person who owns the dungeon had been collecting bdsm gear for probably like at least since the 80s if not earlier than that and you just you collect a lot of stuff in that time period and uh there was a closet that had been turned into a small jail cell and it was great i loved being there and i wish we could have stayed longer and if you are in london and you are traveling um i do not remember the name of it but if you google um london bdsm dungeon for rent um that would be where i would recommend going uh, from what i heard from people i talked to while i was there uh, particularly the London community is rather segmented like there's not a lot of sort of overarching like London community for BDSM there's kind of a lot of individual clubs that was like that was first of all it was a couple of years ago not from the area uh sorry people of London if I'm misrepresenting your kink experience that was just what I heard from people when I was there if it's different uh let me know and I will correct the record um Uh, not my first live stream, but I did go to my first virtual munch in my local community. Does that count? I think it does. I hope you enjoyed it. That sounds like a wonderful time. Um, especially if it's for meeting people. I don't go because I know <laughs> I know all the people I want to be friends with and I just text them. <laughs> That's really it. Oh my gosh. Okay, we have a question here from Ben Riley with the Spider-Man avatar. Love that. Uh, what does feminism say about choking? 
Do I perpetuate patriarchal norms by participating or does it deny her agency if I say no? Do I have agency as a guy here? What if she asked me to call her names? Cringe, I don't, is that the cringe emoji? The one where it's the smile, where it's like completely, like just like, I'm saying this um, for my visually impaired viewers who may not uh, be able to see the question. So, um, there's a lot, there's a lot in this question and I love that you're asking it because it just shows they're really thinking super deeply about BDSM and there is certainly a lot of controversy when it comes to the role of feminism in BDSM. Is BDSM feminist, right? There, a long time ago, ContraPoints, Natalie Wynn, had a video that talked about is BDSM feminist and I, she, she has since taken it down because it was prior to her transition, but I do believe there is an archive of it on her website. Yes, there is. Fantastic. It is, it is on, it is in, uh, what am I trying to say? It's a transcript, so it is not a, a, a full video. Keep that in mind, but it is an interesting I, I like, yeah. Oh, we love, we, we stand Natalie in this house, if anybody was wondering. <laughs> um, love Contra, love Philosophy Tube. I love, I, I watch every love tuber. Um, I, I want to be invited into their club. <laughs> but I do not talk about politics. That's probably never going to happen. Um, but I think that might be a good place to start if you're kind of wondering about an answer to this question. Um, I would say there is not one clear cut answer because feminism is not a monolith. And I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind. Feminism is not a thing where you're gonna, that has like a collective specific answer for everything. Depending on the academic background the person is drawing from, depending on um, just the historical uh, things they're drawing from, the culture. Like the feminism itself is like a field of study, sort of, in that there are many different perspectives on it in the same way that philosophy has a lot of different perspectives within it, right? There's analytical philosophers, there's, you know, existential philosophers. In the same way, there's lots of different ways of thinking about feminism. And so there will be some feminists that say, choking is totally fine, go for it. You know, if, if a woman says that she wants it, that's all that matters. And there will be other feminists who will say, no, Choking does perpetuate patriarchal girl norms, and by doing it, you are furthering the subjugation of women in society, right? And it's not necessarily that either one of those is a flat out correct or incorrect interpretation, because they're just different competing academic ideas, right? Some of them will resonate with you, some of them will fit within your values, some of them will not. And so I think what you have to do is think about what your individual values are, find the philosophy that fits within those values, or use philosophy as a way to explore that, and then try to match that sort of with uh, what you think makes the most sense as like a just worldview, I guess. I'm not sure how to describe that better, especially on the spot, but there you go. Um, I would say that um, as far as denying her agency, I mean, if you have agency as a man to say no to this, or if she asked to call you names, leaving feminism out of the conversation entirely here, BDSM as an experience is about mutual consent from both sides. You consenting as the top to do the things, her consenting as the bottom to have the things done to her. It goes both ways. And um, there's a great, I'm actually making a video about this. Um, so look out for that in a couple weeks, but there's a great model that Planned Parenthood actually came out with like a couple of years ago that's called the Fry's model, which is a way of thinking about consent that establishes that consent needs to be freely given, revocable, informed, enthusiastic, and specific, right? And so I think you need to think about this in terms of like, is this something that you want to do versus something that you feel pressured or obligated to do? Because uh, good consent doesn't look like being pressured into doing something or feeling obligated to do something. So if you want to say yes to this, is this, is this an activity that you want to do that she also wants to have done to her? Great. If you feel like you have to say yes, because if you say no, you're denying her agency, 
that's not really what's going on here. It's not about denying her agency. It's about having a conversation as partners about what you want to do together. And you absolutely have agency here. Again, everyone, both sides of the slash, experience, non experience, like you all have agency about what you choose to do with your bodies. And that not only includes receiving sensations, but also giving them as well. And so if you're not comfortable with it, totally okay. Totally okay. And especially, I think, um, you know, this is certainly something that I struggle to fully capture I think on my channel because it's not part of my personal experience but it is very difficult to be especially um a newer like younger man in the BDSM community in a heterosexual relationship where you're expected to be the top or dominant partner basically like you said like per perpetuating patriarchal norms kind of being the villain right where you're you, they're being asked to hurt people you're being asked to call them awful names things that if you were raised in a moral way were probably said to be bad things to do to people right you're probably your parents told you you know don't hit people you know real men don't hit women uh you know don't call other people names and it, those things can be really deeply rooted in us and it can be like a like a sort of an unconscious response to flinch back and say oh no I can't do that because if I did that would make me a bad person and so I think the process really looks like um getting through that is integrating consent into that and realizing that the intention of behind those values is still true like you know hitting people who do not want to be hit still great value to have it's just that those simple phrases those kind of simplistic ways of thinking about it were made as blanket statements of thinking about consensual bdsm and so you have to remember that there are exceptions to that where it's like yeah don't hit people who don't want to be hit don't call people names when they haven't asked for it but when somebody does ask for it when they are giving affirmative enthusiastic consent for those things to be done that is a very different situation from like calling somebody a bad name on the playground right and that just takes a lot of time i think to fully work through and kind of incorporate into whatever your personal like moral framework is but it absolutely can be done and what i really find has helpful for a lot of people is to find support groups that have people in them that have gone through similar experiences. There are tons of groups on FetLife online for newer male submissives, newer male tops, doms to talk about their experiences dealing with kind of um, their programming that they went through essentially as children and kind of reconciling that with the desires that they have and the di desires of their partners. Um, and yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. It's again, it's certainly not a clear cut answer. It's something that I still think about a lot because I don't, I like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think, I mean, I obviously have a vested interest in the answer being that like choking and hitting people isn't a bad thing and, and isn't anti-feminist. Uh, and there were certainly people who would argue against that. Uh, and for me, it really comes down to thinking about the values of um, consent and not doing undue harm to others and um, making sure that people um, leave BDSM um, being as good or better people than when they got into it. And I think if we can achieve that, then we have achieved, some, achieved something that is in line with feminist values. However, I think there is, if you're talking about BDSM in kind of a larger framework outside of individual relationships, we do also have to consider that the things that we kind of find socially permissible, per, socially permissible within individual relationships do affect how we see things as a whole in society and especially larger things in terms of media representation with movies tv shows pornography hentai like all of that can also sort of like subconsciously contribute to how we perceive people and that gets into like we gotta, you gotta look at like psychological studies and some of them are kind of flawed because it's like well yeah people they, they watched like a lot of the studies that sort of like anti-sex anti-bdsm feminists look at are things where it's like somebody watched violent pornography and immediately afterwards they had like negative more negative views of women therefore we can say that pornography makes people hate women um and that's not necessarily the full story because it's like most studies you will have an immediate reaction after being exposed to something is whether or not that exposure um creates long-term change and how somebody views a particular group or, or views a particular activity right because if it's just five seconds later the reality of that is very different from like 
they are still carrying significantly different opinions five weeks later or five years later because of the things that they've consumed over time. So it's a very complicated conversation, uh, one that I think is worth um, thinking a lot about, something I, you know, I haven't made a video about it because I'm still thinking about it. Um, but hopefully this helped you a little bit on your journey. All right, we have another question from Phobia. Love the name. I recently found out about your lovely self. I am a primal predator and I always thought it was odd until just a few years ago. How would I find a prey? That is a great question. Um, I have a video talking about primal energy, I guess, primal scenes, primal dynamics on my Patreon because I find it is a very, like with feminism and BDSM, a very complex conversation where it is difficult to have a clear cut answer because it, it doesn't have kind of a set community definition in the way that like bondage does or shibari does or like people understand generally what those things are. Again, it's with the exception of things like spanking where there can definitely be nuance there. But um, yeah, I haven't talked about it in public because it just, it it's very hard to talk about in like a concise, concrete way. But I guess more the specific part of your question is how do you how do you find a partner who's also into primal prey um play that would want to do that with you um i mean exceptions always for it being covid 19 times because that is just making everything way more difficult especially finding new partners and uh primal play is certainly not one that's super compatible with internet relationships i guess unless you are really into phone sex and sexting and typing out fantasies to people i'm saying sexting but like it doesn't have to be genital based conversation like you know intimate bdsm role play conversations i guess to be more specific there um i don't generally recommend fat life as a way to meet people um, like, is in like looking for a dating relationship or looking for play partners, but like honestly, like with COVID nineteen, um, and because you're looking for something so particular, I think if there there are lots of groups on FetLife that are for like primal play. I think there's like two or three at least. Uh, I don't know if they have like a personal section on them or if there's a personal board for primal play in particular, that would probably be where I would start if you want something that's really, really specific. General BDSM, if you're just trying to find a partner, like okay, Cupid, actually fairly okay way of finding kinky people. I have found a handful of kinky people on there uh, myself. I have certainly found people I know from like the rope bondage community, poly community that are also kinky, so on and so forth. So if you're looking for a more general sort of BDSM experience uh okc is fine for for meeting people but if you really really want to do primal i think looking for things in particular on fetlife and if there is a personals board on fetlife for your local area that would be probably the best time or what am i saying that would be the that would be the best way to go for something in particular is uh something local if you want to eventually be able to meet in person right um but it's it's very hit or miss it's not not a guarantee i don't want to give your hopes up it's like this is the magical solution finding partners takes time and honestly i've always found it easiest to meet people in person and be especially with primal play which i feel is so emotional and so energy based like it's really hard to get a read for that online like you could be like a guy i don't want to make this sound <laughs> more pessimistic but like you could talk to somebody online for like three months or four months and then meet them in person and there's like no chemistry so um i i i feel you i understand the struggle if you have more specific questions don't feel like you need to super chat again uh I, you don't need to take more of your money i would feel really guilty if i did but hopefully that is a good starting point for the conversation um all right we have a follow-up here um for mr spider-man ben again i'm gonna just call you spider-man ben i hope that's okay spider spider what spider-man spider-man ben <laughs> spider ben <laughs> uh gosh okay mm. ah okay totally understand this all right ah uh, you sound like all of my partners ben i love it okay 
<laughs> so that's my issue. I'm a programmer and autistic, so you think I'm Aristotelian slash Boolean logic often, and ambiguity of social norms are difficult to navigate, though. I like being on the receiving end of race play. Um, none of my partners into race play, so maybe we should clarify that. Um, but I totally let the programmer autistic, like, super, like, hyper-rational logic, like, I so get that. Like, I know, like, I've had so many partners over the years that have ADHD or autism. Like, I, I had a programmers that work in tech. Like, I get it. I so understand that. And having that ambiguity of social norms is really difficult for a lot of people, not even just people on the autism spectrum. But, yeah, I think um, if you wanted to maybe pick a social norm to go with, if you were talking about within the BDSM community, um, as long as you are kind of using one of our ethical frameworks, things like safe, sane, and consensual, or risk aware, consensual kink, keeping those principles in mind will steer you in the correct direction, at least within the BDSM community. If you are going off of sort of larger vanilla frameworks, larger vanilla social norms, then like it's going to be really hit or miss whether or not any kind of BDSM is okay. Um, and so I think it just makes more sense to kind of like judge what your values are and like like I don't I don't know how to phrase this. This is so hard to phrase. Um, like is to kind of think about your framework from like within the community you're working with, you know. And in that case, it would be within the BDSM community and sort of the standards that they have for making sure everybody's having a nice fun time. Um, and I think probably. Oh, gosh, I mean, it really depends on, like, where you are and sort of the groups you're in. Um, I generally, I'm, you know, I'm in a pretty liberal area. Um, my friends are definitely more on the lefty, like, liberal side of the spectrum. And so we really, like, don't have issues. Like, even the people I know that aren't kinky, like, they're very, like, pro-sex work. They're very, like, pro, like, BDSM, personal choice, personal freedom. Like, especially my friends are, like, people I know that are, like, libertarian. Like, they're just like, I don't give a shit. Do whatever you want. Um, um, or the anarchists as well, you know, no unjust hierarchies, which is like, is a BDSM relationship a just hierarchy? Questions that need to be addressed. Um, anyways, not to get off on that particular tangent, but, um, yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated. But I mean, if you're like a really conservative, uh, town somewhere where you don't have a BDSM community, then I think in particular, it can feel kind of hard, like you're conforming to social values, uh, if you were kind of bucking those trends, but like the people I'm around generally are like, even if they're not kinky, they sort of understand um, the premises that make BDSM okay, make it understandable. Anyways, moving on. Next question. Oh, by the way, um, outside of super chats, I do try to answer questions in order. So if I have not gotten to your question yet, uh, super chat or wait till the end or wait till next time because um, I, I will try my best. I do not have a guarantee I will be able to get to every single question but I always endeavor to do so or give people opportunities to answer questions or ask questions elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Ah, have you heard anything about the Lindsay Ellis Omegaverse lawsuit video? Your no legal advice comment remind me of a legal eagle talking about knowing copyright and DMCA, but not wolf porn. Uh, yes. Oh my gosh. I watched that last night. I loved it. I remember when the original New York Times article came out about that. If people have no idea what I'm talking about right now, watch the video because it is a wild ride. Like, it, it, it like, it's like I, <laughs> there's a point where she's on archive of her own and she's showing Omegaverse fan fiction titles and it's like it's like there's a Hamilton one that's like shooting my shot in George Washington's ass which is like I when I saw that I had to pause the video and run upstairs and I just I was against the wall and I was just laughing and I was like sir there's a, there's a fan fiction called shooting my shot in George Washington's ass <laughs> and I just I could not handle it it was so funny um I mean the, like if, as far as I know like Lindsay I'm honestly I'm a little bit Lindsay Ellis was on Twitter and was like I need people to read things for this video I'm doing and I kind of put together it was about the Omegaverse lawsuit um 
I felt too intimidated to ask her if she needed my voice for any readings. Um, Cat Black did an, did an amazing job. Everybody, the Maggie Mayfish, everybody who was on there did an amazing job. The fact Legal Eagle was in that video, um, I loved every minute of it. <laughs> uh, there's not much else to say. I just, I loved it. It was great. I loved it. It was a journey. I laughed so hard so many times. And uh, do recommend. I like, like I said, I read the original article when it came out uh, in the New York Times. But like that was just a whole other level. And like, is Lindsay going to get sued because she made the video? Am I going to get sued because I'm talking about it right now during a live stream? Is that a ice cream truck there's no way any of you can possibly hear this i think i'm going insane did anybody hear that did that come on the microphone at all because for like 10 seconds there was a chime it was not the actual like traditional ice cream man chime but it was definitely like it was was it a baby's toy like <laughs> the mysteries of existence um oh, that's so weird what was that because it sounded like ice cream music but it wasn't the ice cream song and it only lasted for like 10 seconds and then it ended and i don't think any of my neighbors have babies so anyways Moving back to whatever it was I was talking about before. Um, Disneyland makes mouse ears. Yes, that is true. That is true. Mm. Okay, Stephanie, great question. Um, are there any social rules to have religious type scenes in a dungeon? I have ideas, but I don't want to put others off. Um, first of all, amazing you are being proactive and thinking about being in shared space with other people and wanting to make sure you're making other people comfortable great great thing to do um first things first is to always look at the rules of the particular dungeon you are going to different dungeon nights different dungeon facilities themselves will have different rules about the types of play they allow that does sometimes extend not only into don't have things on fire don't have knives don't have guns but also into particular areas of play uh, I'm going to say some words, so uh, content warning for potentially upsetting words, uh, is things like, uh, oof, let's say, uh, race play, you know, for example, uh, Nazi shit, um, uh, uh, those are the two ones that I think I see banned the most often. I don't think I've ever seen anything in particular that says no religiously themed play, um, it is, however, more uncommon. And so if I was trying to decide on a dungeon to go to or a night to go to to have a scene of that variety, I would look at like an edge play specific night, right? Because I think for some people like religious type play would uh, maybe have more edge play connotations because it is such a personal experience. A lot of people uh, experienced like religious abuse as children or um, came from abuses ho abusive homes that had like, you know, kind of religious leanings to them. So I think being sensitive to that is definitely important. But in an edge play environment, people are more used to seeing those types of edgy things compared to if you're going to a BDSM 101 newbie night, um, that might be a little bit more difficult to, um, have in a way where you're not having people like interrupt your scene, right? Ultimately you want to be able to have a good scene, not have people be like, oh my God, what are they doing? Or have people like write complaints on FetLife about like, I can't believe this dungeon allowed this thing to happen, you know? Um, so I would think about the night you're going to in particular. And I think if there's any question about whether or not something is going to be okay, um, I would always tell the event organizers ahead of time of the scene you're planning to double check to make sure that they're prepared for that scene to be in that space, right? Like, like, hey, I'd love to go to your party next Saturday. I'm planning on doing like a religious type scene that's going to involve um, fucking somebody in a latex nun outfit with a giant crucifix while I wear a demon mask and uh, play Gregorian chants backwards. Like, is that going to be cool or not? 
Uh, and that way they can prepare to have maybe the scene space for you, make sure that whoever is going to be monitoring the dungeon that night knows that it's going to be there, so that way they can handle it appropriately. Um, so if people do interrupt the scene, they kind of already know what the story is so they can tell people what's going on. Because I think that's really the biggest risk that I have experienced and people that I know that do sort of edge play type scenes deal with is people not understanding what is going on, calling a dungeon monitor over and being like, this is breaking the rules, you need to end this. And if a dungeon monitor doesn't know about your scene in advance, like they're probably going to be like, hey, top, what's going on here? Is everything... Okay. <laughs> and it's gonna it's gonna break the flow of the scene so if you can tell the dungeon monitors in advance what's happening that's going to kind of um empower them to deal with those situations proactively versus having to interrupt your scene to verify everything is okay and then just everything spiraling um having sort of your own bouncer for the scene can kind of be helpful as well depending on the environment that you're in like having somebody that's there as like a spotter that's also sort of there to intercept people who might have questions about the scene while you're playing. Uh, if you can have a person like that, it's fantastic because they can kind of spot the people that are wanting to interrupt the scene or have questions or look really, really concerned and then go, hey, hi, I noticed you're watching the scene. How are you doing? What's going on? And then they can kind of start the question sort of, in, you know, if you tell them what's going on, you know, here's the storyline of the scene. Here's why we're doing it. Uh, here's, you know, our b religious background, whatever, you know, as much as you would want information to give them, obviously. Um, and they can kind of explain to the person who's concerned or is upset, you know, what's going on. And um, I think really ultimately, beyond kind of having those steps, it's really just about being prepared to have people ask questions afterwards. Be prepared to have maybe those conversations uh, with people who are witnessing the scene who maybe weren't comfortable with it, even if you and your bottom are totally fine with it. Um, and sort of establishing, uh, you know, from the outset, like, do I want to potentially spend several days having fat lab conversations with a stranger who saw my scene and was reminded of their childhood abuse in the Catholic Church or whatever else, you know? So I, I think taking all that into account, like, it's, it's fairly uncommon that that really like religious play in particular would probably spark somebody to have that volatile of a reaction um because ultimately like people can choose to move away they can choose to not watch the scene they can choose to focus on something else you know um but some people you know audience members feel like they need, need a debrief and if you want maybe a more informed answer to this question. I have an interview that I did with Melina Williams, who is really, really well known, uh, in particular for doing race play as a black woman in America, uh, married to an Austrian man that has ancestors who were Nazis. So um, she has a very interesting perspective and experience on um, dealing with not only kind of negotiating your own individual scene, but dealing with um, being in dungeon spaces uh, dealing with onlookers who maybe have problems with the things that you're doing and, and how to kind of have that be part of your sort of risk assessment for the play you're doing overall, if that helps. But uh, I am glad that you are being so thoughtful about it um, and that you are wanting to make sure that uh, your scene is not causing undue harm to others. Uh, I am sewing a corset while watching you. Do you own any corsets? I do. Um, I love dark garden corsetry. I have a few, few pieces from Isabella corsetry, which is, I believe, based in New Orleans. Uh, I don't wear them super often. They tend to be more of a special occasion thing to me. I would love to do waist training at some point, but it's like, you know, number 30 on the list of important things to do with my daily routine. So I've never really committed to it before, but um. Uh, corsets are fun, especially um, for fancy BDSM events. Hi, sweet girl. Are we ready for dinner? Are we ready for dinner? Okay. All right. We're going to take a little minute break. I'm going to feed the puppers, and then I will come back, and we will answer more questions. How about that? All right. See you guys in a minute. Hi, little girl. Are we ready for dinner? Are you know, we're spinning around. My goodness. Hi, for
we're back. <laughs> Their dinner time is normally at 7. So um, when it is approaching 8, which is when my live streams are over, um, I do kind of feel bad about them having to wait longer for dinner. Because they are good puppers and they deserve dinner. All right, mm, moving on. Blanket time. It's We've reached that. I just like, even if I'm not cold, I just... Blankets. You know, anybody feel that? Is there a blanket emoji? Can I tell people to have a blanket emoji in the chat? Or um, something approximating the feeling of a blanket. Uh, <laughs> put that in the chat if you feel like it. Um, all right. Mmm, okay. Uh, in conjunction with previous question. Um, oh, okay, sorry. It did not have a question mark, so I totally missed this. I apologize, Amber. Uh, is it possible to be a part-time submissive only in the bedroom? Yes. That's very. It's a very simple answer. Um, BDSM comes in many shapes and sizes and durations, and there are lots of people who only are submissive in the bedroom. Happens all the time, and it doesn't make you less or submissive if that is the way that you prefer to have your submission oriented. It's all about what works for you and what works for your partner, not what other people's random expectations are. Now, in conjunction with that question, uh, I'm interested in being a service submissive to another woman in the bedroom, plus cooking and cleaning, is this possible? Um, <laughs> my very pedantic answer is, uh, do you have a stove in the bedroom? How do you cook in the bedroom? Um, I'm assuming by in the bedroom you mean you want to be a sexually oriented service submissive and you also want to have cooking and cleaning be part of that. Um, you definitely can. I think the way that I generally talk about service submission on my channel, because this is my experience, is as more of a 24-7 lifestyle dynamic or as part of more of a formal protocol setting uh, as opposed to uh maybe something more bedroom oriented however that doesn't mean that people don't do service submission as a bedroom thing uh and that includes cooking and cleaning as well right like i think maybe the classic stereotype of this is sort of the skimpy french maid outfit um where you get like 20 seconds into dusting something and you go no monsieur and then you you accidentally drop the feather duster and then y you get fucked in the ass um <laughs> or whatever it is you have planned right so um you can totally have service submission that is just um for the bedroom that's just for sexual purposes um but that's not really the way that i talk about it however totally possible um that can also include cleaning and cooking but there's gray areas right it's not bedroom only or 24 7 there's shades of gray in there right like if the cooking and cleaning is like foreplay to the bedroom activities i mean then technically the service submission does extend outside the bedroom um but it, it like if it gets confusing it gets confusing but hopefully it answers your question there's there's uh, you know as the as the title goes there's 50 shades of gray i would say there's possibly even more shades than that um but it's really what you want it to be and what your partners want it to be. So keep that in mind. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, beauty for fun for the $5 donation. I really appreciate it. I don't know if you had a question. Uh, if you did, let me know and I'll answer it. But if you just wanted to say $5 to give me $5, thank you. You have paid for my boba tea for later. Uh, probably not going to have boba tea tonight. It's too late. But um, maybe I'll get boba tomorrow. I really like, I found a place that does vegan boba and it's... It's ace, y'all. It's good. Hot summer day, boba. I used to hate it. I didn't think that I liked it. And I just randomly tried it like two months ago and I'm fucking addicted. What can you do? Mmm. Good question. Um, have you looked into automatic dog feeders? Second question, have you looked in at learning crochet or knitting for making blankets? Um, the only automatic dog feeders I know do not dispense specific qualities like it's just sort of like a drip feed of food which um would definitely not work with the corgi um 
if there is technology that exists that would allow us to have two separate bowls where they each got two different amounts of food maybe um but the corgi in particular he uses one of those slow feeding bowls so it kind of has almost like a puzzle built into it um to, to make it so he doesn't eat so goddamn fast um and i i don't know if those are compatible with automatic dog feeders but i would definitely look into that because I like that idea and I'm sure the technology is more advanced than I'm assuming it is. Um, have you looked at learning crochet or knitting for making blankets? You know, I have a lot of friends that knit and crochet. Um, I have certainly looked into it myself. I, and I definitely like having my hands occupied, but um, I have never actually tried it because Apparently yarn is very expensive and you need a lot of it for a project. And so um, it just seems like it's a lot of time and a lot of materials. Um, and maybe if one day I'm, I'm really bored and there's no internet, like if the internet just gets by, um, then I will probably start knitting or crocheting. Um, but presently... Uh, no knitting and crocheting in in my life other than my friends that do it and it's always so beautiful and I'm like oh my god you made that um I do not have the skill set though I have done cross stitch before though I have done cross stitch not quite the same thing I would go back I would do more cross stitch that's I, I just like I um I feel like that's kind of antiquated do people still do cross stitch um I would though I would love to do like kinky cross stitch uh, if I could freehand cross stitch, which I can't, unfortunately. But if maybe I could, if I could find somebody to make digital patterns for cross stitching that were kinky, and then I could have them in my house and be like, "Look, I made this cross stitch pattern that says um, spank me, uh, please, daddy, or whatever." I don't know. What would people find? What would people want to buy on Etsy <laughs> that would make it worth it? Um, that's what I would do. I think I've seen that before, but. Um, I think it was embroidery. I think it was embroidery actually, not cross stitch. Uh, what is, uh, oh, let's go to the, oh dear, it's messing up. Why did it say warm, why did it, so somebody typed out emojis that said warm blanket feels, and YouTube held that for review. Somebody put down a sponge emoji, uh, and a sweater or a scarf emoji, and YouTube didn't like any of those, so I don't know what I was supposed to think about that okay oh gosh where was I I've completely lost where I was at Sorry, I'm trying to find, like, it did the thing where it just fucking eats my <laughs> chat into the next year. Um, and then I can't, oh gosh, okay. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. So I don't know, I, I have lost a significant portion of the chat because there were too many comments. Um, so I have, I've lost my place. I apologize. Um, Corky is barking, which also helps. Uh, and... Okay, I guess I'm just gonna, I've, I've lost a period of questions, and uh, if your question was one of the ones that got eaten, uh, feel free to ask it uh, at the end of the video. So, mm-hmm. Mm, how can I keep myself in check as a submissive when I am in control at work all day? Any suggestions? Uh, I do have a couple of videos where I've talked about this, I believe, in my, like, general BDSM playlist. Uh, if you wanted to check that out, it is a very common problem. A lot of people, like I think I, it's like maintaining headspace or uh, I've talked about it in a couple of different places. Um, if you can text or if you can 
like at, do something on your lunch break or immediately before or after work like in the car those are great opportunities to make like little moments of submission to kind of bookend your days and and keep you in that frame of mind but like if you're in control of work and you need to be in control of work like personally for me I feel like uh being able to do your job well takes and like maintaining an income and maintaining employment like kind of takes priority over like having this like picture perfect submission you know so um for me I just um I feel like I would prioritize being able to maintain being employed over um having a perfect submissive headspace all the time if that's uh the choice that has to be made have you ever heard of the toronto event organizer the second circle ev um i have not uh i am i'm not anywhere near toronto i've never been to toronto um not really familiar with that is there a reason i should know about them let me know if there's a problem <laughs> Because it wouldn't, there's a lot of people with a lot of problems. Uh, a lot of event organizers in particular. Yes, and if you are wondering about ears or gear, I do have a gear list linked in my FAQ, which is in the description box if you are looking for suggestions. Mm, great question. I love this. Uh, do you have any tips on how to speak up and learn from, quote, elders in the BDSM community? I have a hard time feeling like I fit in enough to talk and learn from people who are more experienced. Um, I mean, honestly my experience with older people in the bdsm community has really been nothing but positive um uh, at least from, from like an educational perspective right i have been to lots of conventions like especially when i was younger when i was like 21 20 um where i was like the youngest person there like by 10 years at least uh and i like nobody really judged me for it like all of them are super happy to share their experiences and a lot, a lot of them are just really happy and especially if you're talking to older people within the leather community and by older i mean like 40s not like on their deathbed like just to be clear older does not mean old it just means older than like however old you are so um yeah i mean i i've always had people i think be really positive towards me being a younger person in the community and actually like approaching me and asking me about like uh, my partner my caller like what I'm learning what I'm here for and just starting conversations based off of that and then people have very much freely um, given their knowledge or are going to munches where it's not age restricted so like anybody who's over 18 can go to them and I've met a lot of people that way that are um, you know older than me or older people in my like local kind of 18 to 35 community and um, I definitely get that it can be hard to kind of speak up and sort of be like, hey, can I ask you a question? But I think really have to remember that a lot of these people are super happy to pass on their skill set and are really sort of like looking to do that. And I mean, if they're an asshole about it, then you probably didn't want to learn from them in the first place because they're just going to teach you how to be an asshole. So uh, I guess the response to having a request for uh, 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 like a conversation is very telling anyways so um i think people are very very willing to help and and want to help so um yeah i think that's it i mean going to classes i think is a great way to do that like um again covid so like real life classes not really an option but online even if you go to classes that are taught online by people who are older members of the community even using that as a way to kind of you know put a face to a name and know if you could message somebody or not what is going on outside with the noises today what <laughs> i it's like it was like a coyote or a dog what was that um anyways elders in the community yeah i think going to classes online um having that kind of be a gateway to talking to people I think is an amazing thing to do um, because most people especially if they're already educators super happy to answer emails super happy to answer questions that way and pass on their knowledge so um, I think really it's just it's more about you having kind of confidence in yourself than it is like presenting yourself a certain way or pretending like you know more than you do like don't put on airs don't pretend to be something you're not like people hate 
fakeness um so just you know be honest be who you are and just have an open mind and most people are super okay with that Mm. can i be a slave baby girl and pet uh like a puppy i feel alone in this i am from portugal um i actually have several people that i know that um are in portugal that do bdsm so you're not alone in in you're not alone in the country of portugal um doing bdsm and definitely people like especially if you're newer to bdsm i should drink some water i've not drank enough water in this holy crap especially if you are newer to kink if you're running across all of these titles and terms it can really feel like you have to choose just one and be like i have to be a slave or a baby girl or a pet or a submissive or a switch or whatever the truth is is you don't have to pick just one you can be as many of those things as you want and switch between head spaces with different people or with the same person on different days or during different scenes you can have things that are sort of like the predominant kind of core of your relationship and some things are things you just do occasionally like it's all variable right you can you can be multiple things at once it it can be hard to do all of those things when you're brand new to bdsm because you're still learning you're still kind of trying things on so to speak seeing what works for you as an individual and uh, I, i probably wouldn't recommend actively doing all of those at the same time but maybe pick one thing to explore with get comfortable with that use that as a learning opportunity for your own boundaries limits and preferences and then add in more dynamics as you gain more experience and become more comfortable with the things you've already had an opportunity to try out versus trying to make them all happen at once Have you ever had a partner with A slash TBI? Uh, I'm going to Google that because I don't know what that is. Um, traumatic brain injury. Uh, I have not had a partner with a traumatic brain injury. Um, I have had, I haven't had partners. I have friends that have had post-concussion syndrome. Uh, and friends that have had, uh, like, head injuries after car crashes, uh, but not a partner that I've, like, done BDSM with, if that answers your question. <laughs> All right, we're getting to the part where people were asking or talking about the uh, Lindsay Ellis video oh yeah the sonic balloon like it took me a minute to remember that like oh man back on deviant art uh this was like 10 years ago back on deviant art um people used to post like very poorly drawn sonic pornography and a lot of it was inflation porn and so it took me a minute to be like oh right sonic and infl- for some reason these are things that go together so um I guess, that, was that the reference that Lindsay was making? Or was it just funny because it was a Sonic character? It was a balloon. I don't know. Um, anyway, it was hilarious on multiple levels. Um, and it did, in fact, make me lose my shit. Apparently, people also heard the ice cream chuck slash other noises. Um, so, yeah. All that business. Oh, my gosh. Brittany was here and she heard it. Welcome, Brittany. How are you doing, girl? Now that I finally seen your uh, seen your message. Um, mm, have you ever struggled with confidence in or out of BDSM? And if so, how did you get where you are today? Oh, uh, if one of my partners is watching this right now, <laughs> they are gonna. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. Um, yeah. They're gonna they're gonna have opinions. Um, definitely, um, like self esteem and confidence are a struggle for me. Like just my whole life. Um, I've been I've been the sort of person 
that struggles with feeling confident and feeling okay with who they are. Like, um, I don't get too much into my own like mental health stuff, so I will just ignore that part of the equation. Um, but definitely outside of BDSM for sure. Um, I would say what, what is interesting for me is I have found that BDSM has really helped my confidence level because it is a diverse set of skills that I have gained a level of competency in and can teach other people about. And so um, it helps me not feel like a fuck up in like other areas of life. Um, and yeah, um, confidence, BDSM, it's a, it's a thing. I mean, personally, like I found, I found BDSM to be very helpful um, for developing more confidence and for... Um, being able to ask for what I want, feeling like I can talk to partners about my needs, feeling like I'm going to have those needs met, uh, feeling like I know what I'm doing. Like just overall, it's been really helpful. Um, and it's really like, I, I can't point to any one thing that like helped me do that. It was really just having it happen over time, right? And this is something that I oftentimes go back to um, during... Um, how do I like just uh, during videos like when I'm when I'm talking about kind of development as a person like it's very rare that there was like one thing or one book or, or something that completely changed everything it tended to be and I, I do see the $20 thing so I don't I'm gonna I'm trying to finish answer this and then we're gonna move on to the $20 one I see I just want to say thank you really quick um it was more kind of a process over time of of um basically asking for what I wanted seeing that it worked feeling better about myself, having kind of just better self-esteem overall because of the things that I've learned about who I am and um, just sort of taking those little baby steps and allowing it to kind of build naturally um, on itself. I don't know if that completely answered your question. Um, it is kind of a nebulous topic uh, in terms of gaining confidence, but um, it was mostly just kind of having BDSM as a tool to be able to allow myself to be confident, seeing that me being confident led to better outcomes and kind of trusting in in that. And um, yeah, anyways, sorry, I don't know if that helped at all. I'm, I feel like that didn't help. Um, <laughs> but so if you, have, if you have other questions or if you're like, that didn't really help me, like, let me know and I'll try to revisit it. But um, let me move on to that. Um, they have a like, is it like a panther, like a cat with a blue eye icon? Uh, I don't, can't, don't know if I can say their name out loud on YouTube. Oh, whatever. I'm going to say life, haha. Uh, and then the swear word that got censored. Thank you for your super chat. I just want to say I love you and your channel. Your videos are what introduced me to BDSM and understand what the community is. I had felt so lost on what I felt uh was missing till i find your channel so thank you thank you so much that is so sweet uh, i mean that is why i have my channel right is um i don't necessarily think of myself as a like mm, a guru or like so i don't know everything right um, i always talk about myself as like i'm a peer educator right i'm not talking about this stuff from like a position of like complete authority that's infallible and perfectly knows everything but it's it's like very much the story of my channel is the story of me also gaining more information and and more knowledge and more confidence uh and being able to give back when i knew i was new in the community and i didn't have these resources even though they would have been super helpful for me it would have helped me avoid a lot of mistakes so if i have helped somebody else understand the community better be more confident have more knowledge do bdsm in a better more satisfying way that I have done my job. Um, I have no, what? Uh, I, uh, is this the Swedish money? No, it's Icelandic uh, kronar. Wow, I have not gotten a donation in that before. That's very exciting. Uh, welcome, Iceland, to the chat. Um, thank you so much for all the educational stuff you have put out. Well, thank you so much for your donation, you know? I mean, honestly, I was so influenced when I was younger by not BDSM YouTubers because they weren't really around but by sex educators like people like Lacey Green and then eventually Sex Explanations when that started and I was somebody who grew up in an environment where I, I didn't really feel comfortable asking about sex if it wasn't really a topic of open discussion um, I went to a school that primarily had a sex education program that focused around showing horrifyingly awful pictures of STIs and videos about AIDS and like 
that was it. Like, that, no, that was not the only thing. We didn't talk about, like, anatomy and stuff like that. But um, it was certainly a very limited education that was not even abstinence-based, but fear-based. Like, the stereotype of, like, if you have sex, you will get AIDS, and you will get pregnant, and you will die. Like, that bit from Mean Girls, that was basically, they literally did they, say that. But, like, that concept, that feeling was what my sex education experience was like and if I can help somebody who is younger you know they're in college they're 18 like they're kind of discovering themselves on their own for the first time um I think it's really great to uh, be able to give back those resources and be able to kind of fill in those gaps in education because this is something that I mean it is still underground right like BDSM is still underground but lots of people do BDSM and it's something that not everybody has access to resources on like if you're in like North Africa or like rural France or Brazil like you probably don't have like the same level of access to online classes and real life dungeons and all these things that I have to be able to make sure you're having a good experience with your partners and so if I can kind of bridge that gap I have done my job anyways that was a really long rant um (laughs) for something that wasn't even a question, but thank you. All right. Maybe we can get back to the question. Not that I don't appreciate the super chats so I don't have questions attached to them, but I feel like um, the live stream is popping today and <laughs> I'm trying my best to get to questions because I feel bad if I can't answer them. Um, that is an ice cream truck. Okay, people are convinced that is in fact an ice cream truck or a ghost. Proposal, ghost ice cream truck. At one point there was an ice cream truck here that got into an accident and now it haunts the neighborhood. That is called using the power of intuition? <laughs> sure, why not? Um, mm, okay, good question. Um, from 2020 Tesla. Is there more to maintenance spankings than just an excuse to engage in some spanking play for no good reason? Um, I have a whole video talking about maintenance spankings. Um, I think like the whole, like the sort of the purpose is in the name, right? It's not just like no good reason. Like the reason is because it helps a masochist feel satisfied in the relationship. Uh, it helps create like a a bonding experience it helps to sort of remind somebody of their position in a power exchange you know or authority transfer dynamic like it it serves it serves a purpose besides just like let's do a spanking although i would say that sometimes it's just fun to have fun you have to know how and sometimes the having fun looks like having a maintenance spanking and having sort of that um oh what's the term uh mandatory fun I guess uh, is another man- if you if you don't like the term maintenance spanking, call it mandatory fun, uh, because it's pre-planned. It's something that happens on a regular basis, and it is ideally supposed to put people in a better frame of mind and help them kind of uh, have fun in life. So there you go. Maintenance spanking. They have lots of reasons, but I do have a whole video talking about it. If you want to know more, if you haven't seen that already. Who are you going to (laughs) call? Ghostbusters, obviously. Man, I have not seen... Have I ever actually seen the whole Ghostbusters movie? I don't think I have. No, I don't think I have. I don't think I've actually seen the whole Ghostbusters movie before. I feel like I've caught it on TV, like the original at one point. Um, But I've never actually seen it all the way through. I should probably watch it at some point. I'll put it on the list. I just wanted to thank you for being my intro to kink three years ago when I was looking for asexuality videos. You are so welcome. I mean, I know so many people that have found my videos through my work on asexuality and then that kind of helped them come to an understanding of not feeling so alone, being ace and being kinky and kind of feeling weird about that. And really, because I mean, it's not really something you hear a ton of in 
like the general asexuality community, but it is definitely present. And I know so many people that are ace that are in uh, the kink world, which is cool, which is super awesome. And I've been meaning, I should, it's been a while since I've done an ace kind of focused video. And I should, I've, I've kind of wanted to do an update because like three, I'm trying to remember how, how long ago it was based on how long my hair was. Uh, like three years ago, I did a video where I talked about sort of my uh, like label and like how I identify and I feel like that's definitely changed like personally for me I find that your any sort of identity that you have whether that be a BDSM label like being a switch or a dom or a top or your sexuality like being bi or lesbian or pan um, I feel like all of that is just a process of evolution where you continually are learning more about yourself and discovering new things about what work for you and so I feel like it's like a good idea to do like an update even if it's just like if you're not a youtuber just doing it with your damn self um and just saying um you know hey this is where I'm at right now this is what you know this is what I'm vibing with because I very much believe in a, a, in a fluid experience of sexuality not everyone is that way some people are like look I was born gay I'm gonna die gay and you know what <laughs> If that's you, I'm so glad that that, like, you know that about yourself so strongly. I personally have always experienced things in a very sort of fluid way. And so I've, I, I've wanted to do an update about that. No promises um, and no spoilers about what would be contained in such a video. Um, but that's kind of, that's where, I, that's where I, f I feel like I'm at. Um, oh, okay. Um, hi, Evie. Um, Ganikita's world? Uh, I do not know how to pronounce it. Thank you so much. Uh, and then we have one from Gerard. Uh, bye, I'm gonna hit the road. This was a fun first stream. I'll be back for sure. Shout out to all the freaks in the chat. Well, thank you so much, Gerard. It was lovely having you here. Uh, wherever it is you're going, have a safe drive. And, uh, next Friday, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, or I guess Daylight Time at this point, Daylight Savings Time? Something. 6 p.m. We're going to be here every Friday. So hopefully I will see you again. It will actually be Mr. Texas's birthday for the next live stream. I don't know if we're going to do something for that on the stream or if he's just going to be off doing his own thing or what. But uh, birthday stream. There you go. Mm. <laughs> uh, meant to ask if there is a cyberpunk kink subgroup uh, Benuda YouTube streaming, etc. Um, probably. Oh God, I actually, I, I know somebody in the community where their like FetLife profile picture is a Mad Max like role play thing that they did. Um, I think it was for Burning Man. Uh, there's a big overlap between people that are into Burning Man and the BDSM community. And then within that, there are definitely people that have sort of a cyberpunk like desert uh burning man aesthetic i've never been to burning man so i have no idea what it's like um but that is based on what other people have told me <laughs> mm, can you give a basic outline for a simple scene like for beginners i do i have a video about that and i have uh, a whole class actually and a, a recording of that is available on patreon um for any level of donation that teaches you the outline of a basic scene, if you want to know about that. <laughs> yes, hello everyone, my name is Evie Lupine, welcome back to my channel, and today I have another video for you all. Yes, that is in fact my catchphrase, that is what I say, although, um, I feel like it always sounds really weird when I say it because um, by the time I get to the take of the video, oh gosh, sorry, I'm like banging everything around here. Um, by the time I get to, to the take of the video that ends up actually being the video that I put on the internet, I have probably said the intro like 20 times. I have said it like at least it's like 20, 40, 50 times. And so when I say it, it is a, hello everyone, my name is Steve Lupin, welcome to my channel. Like, it just all blurs together. Uh, I, I barely hear what I'm saying. A lot of people hate the intro for like some reason. They're like, oh, it just sounds so weird. And I'm like, you know, it's my intro. Make your own YouTube channel if you don't like it. <laughs> oh, goodness. 
this. Hmm. Hmm. A question that just occurred to me, how do your dogs react to pet play? Do they ever look at you like, what is this human doing right now? Um, oh, um, well, I just got totally distracted. What were they thinking? <laughs> I just totally spaced out. Um, so I always do pet play kind of with the dogs somewhere else um, because um, I have strong opinions about this. I feel like... Um, even if you act as accurately as possible like a human like a like a like a bio animal like an like an actual like biological dog you still can't actually communicate with them and they don't understand your body language so if there's toys or food or treats like it's just asking for problems and so I don't feel comfortable interacting with my animals while I'm doing pet play I feel like it gets into the kind of like weird uncomfortable territory so they're usually somewhere else they'll be outside for a while which they love being outside doesn't get too hot here for them um we're in another room we have like a little baby gate that sort of separates our like bdsm play area from the rest of the house so sometimes we'll put them on the other side of the baby gate uh, and they're usually fine with that because they're they're fine with it and we've taught them that it's it's fine um and i mean they're definitely like what are you guys doing but it tends to be more of a like do they have food and are they not giving me food <laughs> like that's usually their primary concern uh bandit in particular who is sleeping right over there um is not a fan of pet play masks like they freak her out a little bit so i especially don't wear pet play gear that covers my face around her because like it is like a it, it, it breaks my heart like at, devastating devastating to have bandit be scared of me and like hiding in a corner and is like i'm scared what is this big scary thing like she literally curls up in a little ball and tries to flatten herself out as much as possible and then just like barks desperately like she's like scared for her life and i'm like my baby no and i know i could condition her to have to have it be okay but like emotionally i cannot even like have it on around her. like i can't even like she is so scared of it that like the amount of deconditioning I would need to do to make it okay for her to be around like wearing like a mask like a pet play gear thing like and I don't know why like I don't know why she's so scared of it like I, as far as I know she like it wasn't abused she doesn't have like it's just scary like she doesn't like it like Corgi doesn't like vacuum cleaners she does not like pet play masks that's like her her thing which is fine we're allowed to have her things oh my gosh how in the world has the time flown we have not read any book at all no book today um but we have nine minutes left so um gosh i'm so sorry we, there's no way we're gonna get to all of these questions i'm gonna scroll through here real quick and i'm just gonna try and and, and uh see if i can find some other questions real quick to answer and uh, then we'll wrap it up for the night. I'm sorry, sorry we didn't get to all of them, but we do stream every Friday, uh, six o'clock. So, you know, if you didn't get to something, or if I didn't get to something, or if you didn't get to ask something yet you wanted to, uh, always feel free to come back next week. Ooh, okay. Uh, can you give some tips to find a quality Don who doesn't play and then quits? Oof, oof. I feel you is it is hard it is it is hard um and again my I feel like my advice on this is always going to be disappointing because I really think the best way to eliminate like 99% of the fuckboys that you're going to meet on like Twitter or Instagram or kick or where do people meet people these days like the best way to eliminate a lot of the people who are kind of fake and are just kind of using bdsm as aesthetic to get sex is to go to a bdsm dungeon go to a bdsm munch and meet people there obviously not really an option right now so probably the best thing to do would be to do an online munch like a local online munch and meet people through that like just make friends and really i think most of the relationships that I know of the BDSM community, almost all of them were started as like a friend of a friend, introduce somebody to somebody else because they knew they were going to be super compatible. Like having a robust network of friends can also be really helpful because they can help you meet other people and they can also kind of help check people for you and be like, hey, girl, 
uh, that guy is a, a real dick. You probably don't want to be involved with him. Um, and I think that that is important to keep in mind. Uh, I'm going to close the door real quick because Mr. Tex is going to be coming home for a minute and I get kind of loud. So, uh, give me two seconds. All right. <sighs> mm, I've been interested in BDSM, but being ace made me feel like there wasn't a space for me. Finding you has renewed my hopes. What are some non-sexual resources that you could suggest for newbies? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, fat life doesn't have to be sexual, but it definitely can be. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that as like, oh, just go there. Because um, I don't necessarily know what your comfort level with that stuff is. Enough to just sort of say go there out of hand. Because it, it can be uncomfortable depending on, uh, you know where you're at uh in terms of like being sex repulsed or not um i'm trying to think i mean like youtube is probably the best um otherwise it's really hard to tell kind of what you're getting into until you already see it so probably like just youtube videos and there's plenty of us now nowadays that make uh kinky youtube videos so hopefully that helps but um yeah um, okay. Um, how did you get your WeVibe Moxie to work? I read a lot of people saying the app and remote do not function. It just worked? Um, I don't, um, have a, I mean, did you watch the video about it? I mean, I just, the app just works. I mean, I feel like WeVibe is really hit or miss. Their Tango is one of the first toys I ever bought and it never worked for me because the charging cable was so wonky and um yeah I um yeah I just I could never get it to work um but that was the tank with the moxie I don't know I just like I used it and uh it just it worked right away and I tested it myself right like I would like I would like I would put the moxie on the other side of the room I would see how far I could walk away with the remote and still get it to turn on and I never had any problems and I've used it in real life scenarios before and I've never had any issues um but I've also owned like several we vibe toys so maybe I'm just used to the way that their stuff works um and I also have an Android one, so maybe it's like an Android versus iOS thing. Sorry, I could be more more help. I'm not I'm not like a WeVibe uh, technical support, um, but I never had any issues with it personally. Trying to sorry, I'm just like scrolling <laughs> to see questions. Oh gosh. Yes, imposter syndrome. Um okay. got back to where I was at oh my wife crochets and I and I weave to our houses like kinky cottage core level 1000 oh my gosh I bet that looks amazing that sounds so cute I love it we have a lot of art in the house we tend to have mostly paintings though we have a lot of paintings in the house not so much knitted or crocheted or woven materials but I love the idea of that aesthetic for sure mmm 
reposting in case this got lost, which it did. So uh, I think this is going to be the last question for the night, guys. Um, how do contracts slash total power exchange work legally? Is there a way to make a type of BDSM contract legally binding? It's so funny you asked this because literally last week um, I was reading. Oh, no, actually, no, that wasn't. That was the book I'm currently reading that I didn't read to you guys today. Um, so... <laughs> BDSM contracts, at least in the U.S., I cannot speak for everywhere else, but I would imagine in, like, anywhere where slavery is illegal, um, you can't own another human being. Um, so BDSM contracts aren't generally enforceable in any way. Um, sex contracts aren't generally enforceable in any way. Um, and I think it would be pretty weird if you tried to make one that was actually like legally binding in some fashion like that is just kind of sketchy to me um so there's not a way to do it like part of bdsm is kind of trusting your partner and then being able to trust you um and having them sign an nda and then saying i'll i'll never you know i'll never accuse you of a consent violation and all this was now and forever completely consensual and the reason for that is like the, the whole principle of things like for example the fries model and like what i think makes of uh you know good robust consent practice is um that consent is revocable at any time in signing a contract signing a, a waiver essentially that says you know i'll hold you harmless if something happens in the scene or like it basically like having a contract at a time like kind of removes your ability to safe word or like removes at least it can theoretically uh you know remove your ability to revoke consent and um, I think that's dangerous. And I think um, I'm maybe I should have legal eagle on the channel. We can <laughs> talk about the BDSM case law. Um, but generally speaking, it's um, not considered a good idea to say that people can't revoke their consent in the moment or um, while something is happening because they agreed to it before the thing actually happened, you know. Um, so I'm not a fan of having permanent BDSM contracts or trying to make something that looks legal because it cannot be legal and I would prefer it to be that case. All right, so that is all of the questions that we have time for today. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and being here. This was a lot of fun. If you guys have any additional questions, if you need help with anything else, um, you can always come back to our next live stream, which is going to be next Friday, which is the 11th already. We start at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time every Friday. And besides that, I do also have a patreon where i help out people with their questions all the time so if you want to check that out link to it is down below and i can also give advice on things that i can't necessarily talk about here on youtube hopefully you guys have a great rest of your friday and i will talk to you again soon bye